Hi guys, and welcome back to History 240. Um, so, looking over things in the schedule for the next couple of weeks, it turns out that you guys have covered almost all of the content um, that you're going to be expected to cover for the whole semester. So, um, that being said, you've got tonight and then one other um, lecture, and then after that you'll have everything that you'll need to have um, to have everything done for... Um, for the content for the final. Uh, your final is going to function just a little bit differently uh, than the other two tests that you've had up to this point. So what I plan to do is um, I plan to give you guys um, an essay um, for your final. Um, it's not a long essay so so don't worry or um, anything like that. You know, you, you guys should be able to, to type it up with plenty of time. Um, and I'm going to give you the essay prompt early, so what I'm going to do is um, you'll have a little bit of extra time um, that you can just uh, sit down and actually physically type, so you'll get the, the essay prompt just a little bit early. And then from there, um, you'll support it and you will get everything ready, and um, then all you'll have to do is just physically type it when you get ready to um, submit your um, your final exam essay. So you guys can go ahead and, and, you know, what I'll do is I'll give you three different questions probably. You can go ahead and think up your responses. You can go ahead and type those up and then you can just submit it um, as the, on your final exam. So it should be, it should be fairly easy for you guys to do. Um, and I think I figured out which question it is that I'm going to ask you for your final. Um, but we're going to we're going to just wait and see. Um, so we're starting to get into modern Kentucky. You guys have um, your essays that are coming up that are due here coming up really soon. Um, I've had one person turn in their essay already. Um, almost everyone else is up to date for everything that needs to be done for the entire semester. So good job, guys. Um, and for that one person who has uh, gotten their essay turned in early, yes, you know who you are. Good job. Good job. Um, so um, I think that's pretty much it. Uh, grades should be up to date. I've had one or two people email me um, saying that there might be an issue with um, part of their grade. So I'm going to look into those this weekend and uh, try to get back to you as quickly as I can on those. Um, I also want to thank you guys for your patience this semester. I know that um, me trying to schedule these these lectures has been a bit erratic. Um, I'm going to be perfectly honest with you and tell you that um, the workload is far heavier than I thought it was going to be um, coming into my first year um, in my first semester as a PhD student. Um, so thank you very much for your patience with me while I'm trying to figure all of this out. Um, it's taken me a little while, but I think I'm finally, finally getting to where I am able to manage the workload in this. I just fell a little bit behind this week. Um, you know, we all from time to time fall just a smidge behind. Um, and I appreciate you guys being willing to work with me on this. So um, that being said, let's go ahead and get started on the content for your next to last, um, your next to last pro or, uh, lecture. Gosh, it's hard to think that the semester is almost, almost over. Um, so let's go ahead and get started. So let me pull this up here. So I know that at this point we've talked just a little bit about some of the precursors um, to World War II and um, the Great Depression. So I know that um, we talked about World War I and we've talked about um, economics just a little bit and how economics work. Um, so with the Keynesian and the Austrian policy. So going along those same lines, coming out of World War I, we're seeing the Roaring Twenties that are not quite as roaring as what we would like for them to be. Um, and, you know, issues with um, prices dropping in certain products and money coming out of the economy because the war is ending and our responses to that. So, um, going into that, you can kind of see how 
uh, things are changing just a little bit as we go into the Great Depression. So let's pull this up here. So something that most people have a hard time realizing is that while the Great Depression is an event, it is a long-term event. So the Depression, as we know it as the Great Depression, is a worldwide depression that lasts from about 1929 to about 1941. And for Kentuckians, many would argue that um, the depression in Kentucky started a little bit earlier than 1929. But the effects of the depression as a country are largely felt um, between 1929 and 1941, which is Black Tuesday to, um, to the start of World War One. So, or excuse me, World War II. Um, once we enter into World War II, the entire country will really gear up for, um, for the war and try to invest the entirety of their beings, not only in their new jobs, but in the war effort. So, um, you can see that there that how that would kind of pull us out of this depression a little bit. So when the event that we know as Black Tuesday happens and the stock market crashes, um, it's under President Hoover, and he's following Austrian policy and he he's taking the approach of the economy will get better on its own. It's okay. It's not a big deal. Um, and you can kind of see over here on the right hand side. Um, some of the um, the pieces of this puzzle that becomes you know the Great Depression and how it, it kind of functions. So you can see that the real gross domestic product or GD or GOP, excuse me, GDP, um, is kind of ebbing and flowing between about 1900 and 1920, and then from there you've got a steady increase through about 1920 to 1930, and right at 1929 during Black Tuesday, bam, you get a big drop, and then it starts kind of slowly creeping its way back up, and it'll drop back down, and then it'll go back up again. And so from there you'll have this kind of rise and fall of um, the amount that we are producing as a as a whole in Kentucky and, and for the country really. Um, and you can also see um, over on the right hand side kind of the fluctuations between um, employment and unemployment um, from about 1910 to about 1960. So you'll see um, U.S. unemployment and you'll see unemployment for the U.S. that's estimated so they don't know exactly how much it is but they're giving a good guess for it and once we start having a census then that kind of changes the way that we we figure out how to do these demographics just a little bit so you'll have a steady somewhere close to between five and ten percent um, you'll have some sometimes in there where you'll have some economic ebbs and flows and then you'll have 1929 hit and Bam! You have unemployment just skyrocket to more than 20% at that point. Some people have estimated it being as high as 25% overall. Um, and in African American communities, um, the unemployment rate will be far higher than it is in white communities. So just keep that in mind that this is a very kind of biased graph right here. Um, and because it doesn't show the effects of how it how it functioned with every American. This is really just the whole average of the United States. So, um, you know, when you're thinking about the, the economy getting better by itself and, um, you know, the, the issues that are associated with this, you can see how these would kind of compound because you've, you've already pulled money out of the economy by the end of the war. You've got more people who are losing their jobs so you're having more money coming out of the economy. And so more people will lose their jobs because there's less money, money in the economy and less money being spent. And that'll cause more people to lose their jobs. And it kind of just steam rollers out of control and, and just becomes infinitely worse over time. And so um, by about the mid-1930s, um, when Roosevelt takes over from Hoover, you know, the people are just in dire straits at that point. Um, there are large homeless communities um, 
because of these business failures and bank failures. And these homeless communities are often known as Hoovervilles. And they're like these little shanty towns of um, just dilapidated kind of semi permanent structures that are made of just whatever people can find. You know, they're made out of tents, they're made out of boxes, um, pieces of like metal sheeting. Um, and you know, they, they are just there to provide enough shelter for basic survival is essentially what it is. And if you look down in this middle photograph, oh, excuse me, this middle photograph, you can see two children who are living in a Hooverville right now. Um, and, you know, this, this kind of like endemic poverty that we see crop up in Kentucky, this is something that will last into well into the 20th century. And we're still dealing with it today. So, you know, issues with, um, crop prices dropping and, and, um, shanty towns and, um, issues with, um, coal mining prices and the amount that coal miners are paid dropping and the establishment of coal camps, all of those things kind of play into this and they're really working, um, kind of moving towards this, um, this depression era. And it is kind of compounding in this. Um, so, you know, just keep, keep those things in mind as we're talking about this. Okay. So, um, from here at this point, when Franklin Delano Roosevelt is inaugurated in March, uh, 1933, he has several platforms. And so I'm going to kind of talk to you about those platforms just a little bit. Um, but I want to make it clear to you that, um, this, that Roosevelt never promises anything specific um, as far as what his plans are for helping people with the depression and dealing with the depression. He just says, I'll try something. I promise I'll try something. And if it doesn't work, I'll try something else. And so with this, you see a lot of people who are, who are just out of ideas of what to do. They're really moving toward that idea of well, the other guy's not done anything. Let's give this guy a chance and maybe something will happen. And he was such a charismatic leader that people just jumped onto his bandwagon and rode his coattails for all it was worth. And, you know, so you'll see, um, like gubernatorial elections hinging on whether or not Roosevelt supports them. And you'll have the first hundred days that, um, that Roosevelt is in office, they will be completely the foundation of the rest of the 20th century. Um, so just keep those things in mind too, as we're going along. But, um, you know, we're, we're going to kind of talk about his first hundred days in pre as president, you know, now. So, just remember he's, his only promise is that he's going to fight the depression in any way that he can. He's going to do something, which is a movement away from kind of Hoover style politics. And this process of doing something is what many people have called the new deal. It's not something that, um, president Roosevelt was like, this is the deal that I'm offering you. No, it was him just going, okay, I've got to give you a new deal. We haven't figured out what that is yet, but we're going to figure it out. And his cabinet members are absolutely essential to this. Um, you know, without, uh, people like Francis Perkins and, uh, especially Francis Perkins, um, and a few other ones, uh, Henry Wallace, for example, you know, Kentucky would just have suffered tremendously at the hands of the depression. So his first hundred days are his most influential days as president, um, for Roosevelt. And among these really, really important pieces, you have 15 major laws that are in, enacted to help Americans who are absolutely desperate, 
um, you've got banks that are on the verge of failure. And when you have banks that are on the verge of failure, you have people who are on the verge of losing their life savings. And so um, you have the Emergency Banking Act, which establishes a bank holiday. And it kind of keeps them open just a little bit longer by saying, okay, we're going to close this for a couple of days. We're going to figure this out. And once we get this figured out, we'll open it back up and it'll be okay. Um, so then after that, they've got the Banking Act of 1933, which is also called the Glass-Steagall Act, um, which is named after the, the, the two people who worked most heavily on this act. And, you know, they were up until like midnight the night before trying to finish this act and get it into Congress so Congress could sign off on it. And I want to say that it was this one that was just written down by hand on a piece of paper when it was taken to Congress. Um, I think the debate lasted all of like 10 minutes. I really want to say it's this one. I'm not 100% on that one, but um, I want to say it was this one that lasted somewhere from like 10 minutes to a half an hour. And that was all the debate that happened with this. And it was signed into law. Um, so you can tell that there's really this like sense of desperation because, I mean, if you think about it and you think about how your current politicians would act in the House of Representatives and the Senate in passing something as crucial as how to deal with the banking issues in the United States and how to deal with half of the banks, literally half the banks left in the United States on the verge of closing. How are you going to deal with that? I mean, you guys can imagine the the desperation that it would take for them to debate for less than one day in order to get this ball rolling. So with this, you've got, uh, with this Banking Act of 1933, it creates a federal deposit for insurance and it reduces speculation in industry. So I'm sure you guys have heard of FDIC. It's on almost every single bank in the United States. And what this does is it guarantees by putting federal monies in a fund, putting it aside, it guarantees the amount that you deposit. And I want to say that it's at half a billion dollars right now. So if you deposit half a million dollars in one transaction, you have a guaranteed deposit there. Your money is there. Your money is good. And so you don't have to worry about losing your entire life savings in a bank panic just because the bank runs out of cash that day does not mean that the bank is going to tank. Okay? So that's the really key piece of this. So um, beyond this, you have people who are just the general public who are scared. They are terrified that they're going to lose their life savings. They're terrified that they're going to lose their homes. You know, you've got people who are who are committing suicide because of, of the depression. You've got men who are running away from their families because they can't afford to feed them because they've lost their jobs. Um, so, you know, this is the level of fear that we're talking about here. Um, and while Roosevelt's platform never takes a Keynesian economic standpoint, you can see how Starting out with this, maybe it doesn't look like it's part of the, the Keynesian policy economics, but they want to balance the budget. And this is the beginnings of this. Um, but as time goes on, you'll, you'll have a more money going into the, into the economy by federal support. And this FDIC is just a small piece of this because it's never been the government's responsibility before for the government to look at a bank and say, okay, if you tank, I'll take care of it. It's never been the the responsibility of the government of the United States to do to make sure that American investments are sound. It's only after you go into the New Deal that you really start seeing this. Um, and so there's a fireside chat about this Glass-Steagall Act, and because of this, and because it is so insanely, like, Roosevelt is so insanely popular, and he just kind of, like, gives off this confidence, people are actually bringing money back to the bank once the banks reopen. Um, and this will lead um, 
to more um, more acts that will help kind of propel the um, the government into doing more spending. So the next one is the Economy Act, and I, it sounds a little backwards here based on what I just said, but essentially what they're doing is they're slashing government spending um, by taking um, about five hundred million dollars and saying that okay we're no longer going to fund veterans um, in order to balance the budget and this is highly unpopular highly unpopular but the United States is in such desperate straits that they really don't have a choice but to balance the budget and slash spending somewhere and you've got this giant portion of the budget that's going to veterans and trying to figure out how they're going to fund these veterans is a major issue. Um, and so if you watch the YouTube video that's posted just below this, it will cover um, that fireside chat from, from President Roosevelt on what they're doing basically with the economy. And it'll give a basic overview of how the banking system works. So I'm going to give you guys just a second to... Um, to watch that video, so go ahead and pause me and watch that video real quick and then come back to me, okay? Okay, hold on. Okay, so it looks like I'm hoping you guys have gotten that video watched, so we're going to go back into it. Um, another part of um, the New Deal, and that's really important for just Kentucky, is that um, President Roosevelt will repeal prohibition. So, um, you know, as you guys know, you've had um, prohibition that has completely closed most of the bourbon industry and most of the alcohol industry in Kentucky. You've still got some producers of alcohol, um, but for the most part, it's been made illegal. So, putting alcohol back in Kentucky and back into production will help stimulate the economy in Kentucky specifically because Kentucky is incredibly hard hit. You know, urban areas are generally considered the most hard hit. But in rural areas, Kentucky's at the top of it. Generally is the thought. Um, because farm, price, farm prices have fallen so far. Because coal and the price being paid for coal has dropped so far and the price is being paid to workers for coal and for planters it's it's a really really bad time to be in rural america um it's the worst time to be in the city um but it's a really bad time to be in rural america because a lot of people are losing their their farms and they're losing their entire life savings um you know just by putting your money in the only bank that's in town and when that bank goes under then you've lost everything absolutely everything so, well moving on from this with the repeal of prohibition you've still got this idea of priming the pump um, and so then what they're wanting to do is they're wanting to get unemployed people back to work so that they can prime the pump themselves so they can throw a little bit of money back into the economy. So what they're doing is they're throwing a little bit of money out there and they're waiting for people to pick up these jobs and then run off with it and then move the economy forward and they continue to prime the pump and they're pumping the economy based on their work. Um, so you'll have the development of something called the Works Progress or excuse me, the Public Works Administration and it'll be um, established to organize and fund useful works to get people back to work. Mostly this will be on infrastructure. It's also called the Works Progress Administration. Um, and this, you can see these WPA projects all over Kentucky. They're everywhere. Um, you know, there are five or six that are here just in Fayette County, where I am right now. Um, Boyd County has two or three. You've got um, you've got several that are in uh, Carter County. You've got them all over. They are in every single county in Kentucky. Um, and actually, if you want to view some of these, if you look up the Goodman Paxton Photographic Co uh, Collection, just Google that. It'll lead you to something that says Explore 
uh, I think it's Explore UK, and it is the UK library website that anybody can access this collection, and it is a photographic collection, so you can go in and you can find your county and find the works progress, excuse me, works progress administration pieces from your county there in that collection, and you can see those those projects. Um, so if any of you guys have ever been to um, to a UK football game, then you'll know that um, Kroger Field is not the original field. There was a field called Stoll Field um, that was the original football field for Kentucky. The WPA worked on that. You've got roads. You've got um, places that were um, historic sites that have been fixed up. You've got ditches. You've got bridges. You've got gobs and gobs of stuff that are like basic infrastructure pieces um, that the WPA um, or PWA, depending on what you want to call it, um, they've worked on and they have used that in order to get people back to work. And so, you know, you might have a group of people who, um, one of these WPA projects are, are coming into that area and you might have, you know, 500 people who sign up to work on that work project. Now, whether they actually get to do that, you know, is, is questionable. Um, but, there'll be some kind of work done and it will benefit the public at large. Um, courthouses were another big one. So, you know, if you think back to how many times you personally have been inside your one courthouse, there are just gobs and gobs of courthouses um, in Kentucky that were built by the WPA. So those are the kinds of projects that I'm talking about. Parks, you know, things where you've either got everybody using it because it's basic infrastructure or everyone is using it because it's an essential piece of the community. Okay. Um, so beyond the, the WPA or the Public Works Administration, you have Henry Wallace who becomes Secretary of Agriculture and he is working on specifically getting farming prices back up and back on track. Um, he also works with the Tennessee Valley Authority um, and so his plan is to curb flooding in the Tennessee Valley and in the South um, and he'll create he'll work to create um, hydroelectricity and modernizing poor farms in rural Kentucky and other rural areas um, to try to bring them up to a modern standard because most of Kentucky has no electricity most of rural Kentucky has no electricity up to this point. Um, you've got some places that are in like coal camps and places like that that have some electricity, but Kentucky as a state at large, all the rural, rural areas, they don't have electricity at this point. And it's not until the WPA steps in and the Tennessee Valley Th Authority steps in that you really start seeing electricity pop up in these rural areas. Um, and so, you know, issues with like the, the 37 flood and, um, you know, flooding all along the the Mississippi side and border of Kentucky. They're the ones who um, are really working with the, the Tennessee Valley Authority. But the price bump is the really key piece that Wallace works on. And Wallace has a very long heritage of working with agriculture. Um, he, his father had an agriculture newspaper before him um, and so he becomes this editor of agriculture and his favorite thing to do is to like genetically splice plants and figure out which ones will produce the best products. And so it's because of him that we no longer have um, pretty ear of corn contests in Kentucky and other places because he was able to definitively establish that the prettiest ears of corn are not necessarily the most productive stocks of corn. And so when looking at food and how much food needs to be produced, it's because of him that we no longer have pretty ear contests. Alas. Oh well. Um, so um, going on from there, his plan is that we're actually going to destroy some of our crops every year and there will be a subsidy for farmers that if you don't produce we'll, we'll pay you 
not to produce anything or to just kind of get rid of it. And so, you know, there'll be a little bit of backlash from this, um, especially um, within those those areas where, you know, you've got hungry people, you know, people in cities, they're starving, they have no food to eat. And yet on the fringes of society, you've got um, these rural areas where you've got people who are slaughtering pigs left and right and sowing under their their corn and their wheat and their grains to pump to bump up farming prices they're literally just taking this stuff and destroying it in order to get farming prices back on track but you've got people starving so there'll be a little bit of backlash there um, but for the most part I think most Americans really kind of understood you know that the market is being driven at this point into the ground um, because there's there's just too much of this product and so you know there'll be some some question over whether or not we should just dump it overseas and see if you know if we can sell it overseas for cheaper and things like that um, but this doesn't really work because the depression is worldwide at this point so it's not really doing us any good to have food going overseas when the people who are overseas can't buy the food either um, so it just kind of makes more sense to, to plow it under in order to boost up the um, the prices. Uh, you also have the establishment of the Civilian Conservation Corps, um, which tend to work with um, National Forest. So you've got under Teddy Roosevelt the establishment of a couple of um, National Forest, um, but it's really um, FDR who takes those establish national forest he'll make more of them but he'll also develop the ones that are already in place by building like picnic shelters and paths and things like that and it'll be the civilian conservation corps who largely does this um, so you know anytime you go into a national park um, and you see something that says CCC on it that's the civilian conservation corps and they are just working to kind of like conserve nature and help bring people into nature so that they can appreciate nature. Um, and that's, that's the only truly Roosevelt is the only one who has anything to do with this idea that Roosevelt had because everything else that is here that we've talked about so far, um, this is, this has all been other people. Um, I mean, you've got uh, the Glass-Steagall Act for the um, Glass and Steagall are the ones who developed this idea. You've got Francis Perkins who's working on Social Security and the, and and um, minimum wages and things like that. She'll she'll dabble a little bit in the CCC, but she's really not that interested in that. But the WPA that is her project. Um, the Agricultural Adjustment Act that's Henry Wallace. Um, you know anything that has to do with farming is Henry Wallace, and so. You You've got these essential cabinet members just kind of sprinkled around um, here and there. And they'll really play into this. But the CCC is really the one, the one piece of the New Deal that is uniquely from President Roosevelt. Um, so there you go. Um, with the Farm Securities Act that I talked about before, this is another one of those Henry Wallace kind of um, ideas. And the idea is to reduce output and this is where the subsidies really come in um, for for farm incomes um, by reducing output raising income raising prices um, and subsidies for those who will stop producing this is where that really truly comes into play and then you've got the um, the uh, Agricultural Adjustment Administration, which is another one of these acts, and they're they're trying a couple of different um, things to um, try to get this farm economy on track. And so, you know, you'll have some artificial bumping up here and some artificial bumping up there, um, and then you've got um, the establishment of raising practices through artificial scarcity and domestic allotments um, for for total output and again subsidies for fallow fields so just not planting at all will give you a subsidy for it instead of just for plowing it under and reducing output just don't don't grow anything this year and we'll pay you for it um, 
this this isn't always something that's thought of as a good thing, but it worked here. Um, so, and that's one thing that's really important about the New Deal is that they really looked at the situation at hand and said, okay, what can we do to fix this specific problem at this moment? Because it's really all they could do. They knew they couldn't fix the depression as a whole. So it was kind of like just putting a band-aid here, putting a band-aid there, putting a band-aid there and hoping something stuck for long enough to get them out of this economic downturn. And then you've got the Secretary of Labor, um, whose name is Frances Perkins, and she is the first cabinet member um, in the United States to be female. And she is just absolutely essential for all of those things that most Americans associate with modern America. So Social Security, minimum wages, maximum hour laws, unemployment insurance, things that are kind of like the safety net for America. And, you know, so if you lose your job, you've paid into unemployment. So you've kind of got this unemployment insurance that's set aside that's money for you to use in case you lose your job. Um, minimum wages. Um, you know, the idea that um, many women would work for a good long time and maybe not be paid the same amount as their counterparts um you know, it, it really is something that stuck with Frances Perkins. And if one of them married, then her, the fact that her wages would drop, those, those were the kinds of things that, that really, that really stuck with Frances Perkins. Um, there was also, she was also part of this child labor law movement. Um, you know, old age insurance that became the Social Security Act. These are all pieces of Frances Perkins. And, things that she really put her heart into. Um, you know, she, she saw something called the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory Fire. And from that point on, she really took steps in promoting safety and advocacy for these, these women who are in these really just kind of dire situations. Um, and, you know, she took a very practical approach to it. I mean, she would go into these places where people were working and she would walk around the factory and, you know, watch people. And, you know, she noticed one person, they had to take like a 10 foot drop between um, the, the, the ladder that they had to walk down to get into the factory and the floor. And so those kinds of, of issues where people could get hurt really badly, you know, having to dangle themselves down and then drop, um, you know, from, from ladders and, and things like that. That's really Frances Perkins work. Um, and so we can see her hand in the majority of New Deal policies at some point or another. She and a guy named Moley, who is, um, another one of, uh, of Roosevelt's, um, members who really plays a, a crucial role in his his policies. Um, they kind of butt heads a little bit, but she kind of finds a workaround um, in, in which she's kind of able to look at, at President Roosevelt and be like, you know, I really think you've got something here, Franklin. Let's, let's work on this a little bit more. And so, um, you know, if you read um, a book called Nothing to Fear, you kind of get the feel for that. Um, and, you know, the her abilities to kind of work President Roosevelt into thinking of these, these kinds of concepts and mull them over a little bit and maybe kind of like get her over onto, get him over onto her side and establish these things that are really innately U.S. pieces. It's all because of her. So she's, she's incredibly important. Um, so let's move on to the next slide. Um, so I wanted to show you guys some of the WPA and some of the CCC projects that are um, here in Kentucky. And some of these should be very familiar to you. Um, I want to say there's over 300 um, WPA projects in Kentucky. Oh, excuse me. And so um, for the WPA and the PWA, um, city halls, bridges, um, law schools, armories, parks, um, they're just, they're, they're kind of all over the place. Football stadiums, um, you know, these are just a sampling of them. This isn't even the, the full measure of them. Um, and many of these structures are still standing. 
Um, you know, there are other places like National Bridge um, State Park, Pine Mountain State Park, um, Daniel Boone National Forest and its restoration, uh, Mammoth Caves National Park. Those are all CCC projects, and those are all pieces of um, the New Deal. So just wanted to give you like a quick smattering of those, but definitely look up the Goodman Paxton photographic collection. You'll have some really, really neat uh, pieces that you can work off of, and they may be um, good pieces for your primary source document analysis. So just keep those in mind, possibly. And so from here, we're going to go ahead and we're going to talk about World War II.